Live from Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York, I'm Shanali Basak. And I'm Katie Greifeld in for Kaylee Lines. Welcome to Bloomberg Crypto, a look at the people, transactions, and technology shaping the world of decentralized finance. Now that the Coin Tucky Derby is in full swing, we give an update on who is winning the flow race for spot Bitcoin ETFs how it might be weighing on the coin's price. And now that these funds are trading, we're going to look ahead to the next big event. That's halving. We speak with Bitcoin mining advisor Amanda Fabiano. And it was the hack heard around the crypto world. The SEC now out with details about how the fake Bitcoin ETF post came to be ahead of the official announcement. But first, we're going to get a check of the market here because for all that excitement, we do have a lot of pressure on cryptocurrencies. We have Bitcoin down about 1.2% on the day, and on the week, we have it down more than 9%. Ethereum, remember, this got a big lift after those ETF approvals because of the excitement around a potential Ethereum ETF as well. But guess what? Now it's down more than 4.4% on the day and almost 14% in a seven-day period. And Marathon Digital finally flipping green here. You do have the miners starting to whipsaw here with the pressures you're seeing in the broader crypto ecosystem, particularly in Bitcoin. But I also want to talk mostly about the exchanges because this is where you're really seeing the pressure. You have Coinbase now down 1.7%. There was a big downgrade. Remember, this is a stock that rose almost 400% last year. And now this year, you have it down almost 30%, sitting now at the lowest level since November. And it comes after JP Morgan's downgrade of Coinbase this morning. JP Morgan saying that they see greater potential for cryptocurrency ETF enthusiasm to further deflate, driving down lower total token prices, lower trading volume, and lower ancillary revenue opportunities for firms like Coinbase, Katie. And let's also take a look at my favorite thing to talk about, and that's flows into and out of the U.S.-listed spot Bitcoin ETFs. We know that all 11 of them, 10 or 11, launched at once, and it's increasingly turning into a race between BlackRock and Fidelity. Of course, when it comes to volume, Grayscale is winning with over $10 billion of volume so far. But that has mostly translated into outflows. Uh, GBTC sitting on $3.4 billion of outflows so far. It's going to be really interesting to see how that develops. But let's talk about IBIT and let's talk about FBTC, of course, the BlackRock and the iShares product. You can see that both of them have above $3 billion in volume. And that increasingly has been for inflows. You take a look at total flows going into IBIT so far, $1.7 billion. That is by far the leader. But you have Fidelity's product not too far behind at $1.4 billion, increasingly pulling away from the pack. And I caught up recently with BlackRock's Rachel Aguirre about what she's seeing in terms of flows for IBIT. Flows come from a number of different directions. Clearly, you know, the interest we're seeing is both from retail, from self-directed um, investors. And there are some who were ready to invest on day one, but we're also focused on those investors who are just now beginning to look at this new asset class. And we're very excited about that. Joining us now is Bloomberg Intelligence strategist James Saford. And James, talk to us about this race so far. Again, to my view, it looks like this is just a BlackRock and Fidelity dead heat. How are you reading it so far? Yeah, I mean, that's obviously what's happening. I mean, the number one thing that I'm watching is obviously <laughs> Grayscale's outflows, to be to be completely frank. But the other thing is, as you mentioned, it's, it's IBIT and FBTC from BlackRock and Fidelity. The one thing I would add is that there is a healthy middle class forming with these ETFs, with the likes of ARK and 21 shares, uh, Invesco and Galaxy, Bitwise, um, VanEck. These guys are all around, all have over $100 million in assets in their brand new ETFs already. So that is a healthy ETF product to be offering to clients, even though they're getting overshadowed by some of these other players. Yeah, James, you started talking about the grayscale outflows, and you've written recently about the relationship to FTX and DCG. Is it mostly those two uh, relationships that are drawing on the decline, or is it kind of a vicious cycle that leads to other selling? Yeah, I mean, it's possible that selling might lead to selling, um, but I think that there are un undoubtedly a bunch of institutions that had a bunch of money in this thing um, that were forced to hold it, namely FTX, DCG, probably some others due to bankruptcies. There were also institutions that were buying this thing that were 
to play basically the ETF approval. They wanted to go up and play the ride up. It went up 80%-ish. Uh, now it's coming down a little bit. And then you also have plenty of people who had exposure to this thing, what is, particularly if it was an attack advantage account like an IRA, they're not worried about capital gains. So they're just going to sell and flip and go somewhere else. So there's a whole bunch of different selling happening here. There will be some people that are trapped if they have a brokerage account and they don't want to deal with the 20% long-term cap gains or 15% long-term cap gain. They don't care about GBC's 1.5% fee. So it's yet to see where that floor is on these outflows. But we saw a record outflow yesterday from GBTC so far at $640 million. So I don't know when it's going to stop. But there's a lot of different things here at play. And the ETFs are just one small slice of the market. James Safer, thank you for joining. And thank you for following that ETF race. And ahead of that race, in addition to that race, there's another big catalyst that a lot of investors have been looking forward to for crypto, and that could be the Bitcoins having expected in the coming weeks, really. And let's discuss this further with Amanda Fabiano, founder of Fabiano Consulting and former head of digital uh, mining for Galaxy Digital. Amanda, how significant do you think the mining um, industry will be impacted by the having event? And what are the cross currents that could really create some tensions, frankly, in the future of this currency for the next year or so? Great question. Um, when we think about what the halving is, it is a seismic event that happens in Bitcoin every four years. When a miner mines a block, they receive both a block subsidy and transaction fees. And so every four years, this block subsidy that a miner uh, receives from the work it's done is cut in half. And we call this event the halving. So miners' revenue from um, block subsidies at block number 840,000, based on current difficulty of, of the network, we are assuming this will be around April 2024, that's when a miner's revenue gets cut directly in half. Um, so if we look back over the past year, miners have earned 3,000 337,494 Bitcoin just from block subsidies alone. So luckily, what we're seeing is there's been some relief for miners with the increase in transaction fees on the network. So the security budget of Bitcoin is often a topic, especially around the halving, that becomes really popular. And so transaction fees and adoption of Bitcoin, we're hoping, will increase, thus making miners continually profitable. profitable. But miners do have to be careful about where they're at in comparison to the cost curve um, across all miners on the network. If and they're not profitable after the halving, they won't be in a good position. Right, Amanda. And I mean, on that thought, what is the break even rate for a lot of these miners right now, the Bitcoin price at which uh, actually these mining operations become profitable? It's a great question. Um, so what happens is it's really dependent on the miners' operations. And that question is really hard to answer um, based on individual miners, right? Uh, luckily, with the, the emergence of public miners, we've been able to see a little bit more insight into the network to see, hey, this miner is sharing all of its financials. It's mining at X cost, right? So, you know, if we think about as the price has been declining, what really um, we should be focusing on is hash price, not just the Bitcoin price. Mm. So hash price is the break-even point um, that combines both Bitcoin price and hash rate, which are both contributing factors to a miner's break-even cost. Well, let's talk a little bit more about the hash rate, because as you point out in your notes, we saw it drop pretty significantly last week. Of course, you had some miners yeah. shut off in Texas. When do we see them come back online? Um, so we've seen that bounce back up. So we're seeing hash rate at about 520 exahash for a three-day moving average, which shows, you know, the security of the network is really healthy. Um, we saw over the past two weeks about a 25% reduction in hash rate, which was due to Texas miners shutting off. Um, so Texas has a really unique grid where miners are able to curtail their energy and sell that energy back to the grid. Um, so it was a massive cold snap in Texas, and we saw that uh, that live on the network. So what's incredible is the ability for miners to be able to be extremely flexible. But what this also shows is the concentration of miners in Texas. How should miners be preparing for the halving event? And to your point, adoption really impacts profitability moving forward. Are there real risks for them moving forward? For sure. I, I think, look, Bitcoin mining is the fairest competition in the world. And you have to be on that low end of the cost curve against all miners to survive not only this halving, but future halvings. Um, what, what's incredible about the Bitcoin network is you really don't know where you are, what your average cost is compared to other people. Um, but you do know, you know that you have to be on the low end to survive. So I think you know, leading up to the halving and even in its aftermath, miners will need to place a substantial emphasis on strategic planning. And you know, if you're not growing, you're really dying in mining. You think I about... Think we'll 
Yeah, you think about how many options investors have these days, Amanda. For example, you could have bought a publicly traded stock of a Bitcoin miner to get exposure to Bitcoin, but now there are the ETFs. Do you yep. think that capital uh, constraints will exist for these miners moving forward when investors just have more options to be exposed to Bitcoin? Um, so, you know, when you think about it in comparison to like I, I, how I looked at it was like gold, right? So I looked at the gold mining ETF and what happened to gold mining stocks after that. And it's not a perfect comparison, obviously, because there's significant differences. Uh, but both of them should be risk off assets, right? And um, when the world is going differently, people invest in gold and hoping, you know, Bitcoin will kind of follow that similar trend. With that, we saw gold mining stocks kind of increase with the price of the ETF um, when the ETF was launched at, with gold. So I think that, you know, there's with the amount of capital inflow that is happening, I hope that people will continue to invest in mining uh, stocks as well as the ETF. Yeah, it'll be fascinating. Optionality. Yeah, exactly. Options are important. Of course, it feels like everything is going down at the moment. So it's going to be interesting to see if that changes. But Amanda, obviously, you have a very unique perspective on the mining industry. Of course, the former head of mining over at Galaxy. Do you see a coming wave of consolidation when it comes to these Bitcoin miners? For sure. I think we'll see. And we, all, we already have started to see that M&A activity, consolidation, shifts in strategies leading up to and post the halving. I think we'll also see miners focus on different revenue streams going forward. And a lot of that will be tied closely to the energy sector, I'd say. Things like graveyard for machines and oil and gas mining setups, waste removal, heat recapture. There are also already some private companies working on all of these things. That is a prime uh, you know, target for an acquisition for some of these corporate miners. So that's really exciting. I also think generally utilities are waking up to Bitcoin mining and, and willing to be more collaborative. All right, Amanda, always great to catch up with you. Really appreciate your time. That is Amanda Fabiano of Fabiano Consulting. Thank you so much. Now coming up, Anthony Pompliano joins to discuss what's next for crypto. He says that the Bitcoin ETF approval signals a new regime. And give you new details about the hack of the SEC's X account that led to the premature posting of ETF approval. And to access all of the latest data and news on crypto, check out CryptGo on the terminal. This is Bloomberg. We view the, the offerings of the products different enough such that they're, they're really not direct substitutes, if you will. And so, um, yes, there's a different price point for that product, but it's a different product. And so um, we don't you know, have any plans to adjust, adjust fees or, 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 or anything of the like you know, due to this introduction. Like I said, I think we offer a plethora of different you know, products and services that you know, differ in a lot of ways from the, from the ETF. Kraken CEO Dave Ripley on the business implications of these new Bitcoin ETFs. And we're joined now by Anthony Pompliano, a founder of Pomp Investments, who actually invested in the exchanges early on, Coinbase, for example. But when you look forward now in the era of a Bitcoin ETF, is a business model like Coinbase's in severe threat, frankly, given the ETF flow? Yeah, I think the public markets drastically uh, underappreciate what these businesses are, right? So if you think about it, everyone knows the exchange business, everyone knows the custody business, but Coinbase has kind of quietly been transitioning into a Web3 uh, or kind of crypto native uh, revenue as well. And so they have this new blockchain base uh, that's driving a lot of revenue. And so really what I think public market investors should be thinking about, whether it's Coinbase or other uh, of these public companies, is go stack rank every single one of these companies by what percentage of the revenue comes crypto native. And the higher the percentage of crypto native revenue, the more mispriced they probably are in the public markets. And I think Coinbase is a great example. Speaking of crypto native, you have kind of the ETF, you have other kind of stocks tied to the crypto industry, but then you have things that are actually decentralized, things that live in Web3, a word that we don't hear a lot <laughs> anymore on these programs. Where is the value anymore as an investor? Do you start to look at more mainstream Bitcoin and the Bitcoin-related products that have attached to Wall Street, or do you look into Web3? 
Well, I think it's all the same thing, right? If you really think about it, Bitcoin was the one that kicked off this entire revolution. Um, when you look at the monetary uh, competition, I think Bitcoin is by far the winner. Uh, now there's going to be a big technology competition. And really, when you look at this sector, I think a lot of people want to put it in a separate bucket. But I look at this just as another macro asset that you can go in and you can invest in. And so what we have seen is young people specifically are putting their capital into this sector. This sector has outperformed drastically, even with the recent pull down. You know, Bitcoin is still up like 75 percent or something. And and so I think that investors who want to have outperformance, they're going to have to allocate to the sector. And the ones that continue to fight it, they're just going to get left behind. Anthony, I want to get back to the spot Bitcoin ETF discussion, but I have to ask you a little bit more about Coinbase. Obviously, it had a great year last year, up nearly 400 percent or something like that. You take a look at the 2024 performance down, what, 28 percent year to date. Is that a dip that you're buying? Um, so Coinbase, we just held the uh, position. And what I think really, again, it's the number one regulated exchange in America. And so if you're bullish on this sector, you've got to be bullish on Coinbase. Another thing is they're the custody provider for many of these ETFs. And so in some weird way, they're almost taxing the entire ETF uh, kind of trend. And so I think Coinbase will continue to be a leader. Um, and overall, that's good for the industry. But I also think it's good for Wall Street, right? Wall Street doesn't just want to have a bunch of assets that are sitting there that they can't access if they're on you know, non-public exchanges exchanges. And so having a stock like Coinbase that they're able to allocate to, I think is actually good for them as well. I want to get a little bit philosophical here because I'm looking at your notes. You write about this new regime that this uh, spot Bitcoin ETF approval is bringing about different investors, less volatility, more mainstream adoption, less volatility. Doesn't that just mean that Bitcoin trading is going to become less fun? Definitely. Uh, I always joke that when the suits show up, the fun is over, right? And, and so to some degree, um, if you really think about what these new investors do, they have different behaviors, right? They rebalance their portfolios. Historically, what's the meme been? Hold, right? You don't rebalance. Hoddle, actually. Hoddle. And so uh, on top of that, you also will see a lot of use of derivatives. And so there is a lot of capital that's going to flow into these ETFs. We're seeing that already. But when you start to see derivative usage, I think that some of that will pull away. It won't actually move the underlying. And so people just have to realize new investors, new behaviors. Uh, the days of 1,000% returns in a single year are probably over. The good news is that an 80% drawdown is much less likely. Doesn't mean it won't happen, but much less likely now that volatility dampens. And you are indeed here in a suit today. Uh, you know, you have we have Bitcoin ETF approval, but what about the rest of them? Do you think an ETF tied to Ethereum or another type of crypto asset could make as much sense? This is one of my big bets over the next couple of years. So I think that the altcoin ETFs are going to be a massive area for innovation and also value to be created. Uh, we recently uh, took one of our businesses, Reflexivity Research. We sold it to a Canadian uh, publicly traded asset manager called DeFi Technologies. One of their subsidiaries, Valor, this is their whole strategy. Basically, go and find all of the altcoins that Wall Street wants access to, but they can't get access to, and create ETPs in Europe. And so we think that capital is going to flow heavily into the Bitcoin uh, ETF, but it also is going to flow into all of these other assets. But how do you parse what's real from the noise? And especially when you think about the, uh, the SEC and the crackdown they have on so many of these tokens, on so many of these exchanges, how do you make a bet on any of them? There's more nonsense in the public equity market than there's in the crypto industry in terms of these assets. And so when you really look at it is crypto is a free market still for, for many uh, purposes. And so there's been a lot of clearing out, but the market has done that. Right. When you look in the public markets, I mean, you guys cover almost on a daily basis, someone doing something stupid, a company that, you know, said it was doing one thing and ended up not being successful. And so uh, bad people will do bad things. Markets will ultimately kind of uh, figure out who the winners are. But I do think that in this sector, there's a lot of people who have said, hey, there's no value there. Right. You know, Warren Buffett told me it's not valuable. But again, these assets have outperformed something like a Berkshire. And I think that people need to go spend the time to actually learn about it. I want to talk quickly about stable coins. Obviously, one of the big conversations in the crypto uh, sphere over the past few weeks has been about Tether's reserves. Obviously, the CEO of Cantor Fitzgerald saying that he's seen them. They're there. Is Tether the stable coin of the future? So one of the interesting things about Tether and USDC, USDC was rising in adoption, uh, but it's a regulated stablecoin in the United States. And so actually people internationally don't like that. That is a turnoff to them, is that there's now a coin that the United States government has a lot of oversight in. And so Tether has continued to see adoption go up. Uh, they are the 16th largest holder of U.S. Treasuries. At this point, they are an essential part of the American financial economy. So what does that mean for Circle then as it looks to IPO? Would you be a buyer? 
an IPO stock. I, I think Circle's an amazing business, and especially with high interest rates, they're going to continue to do very, very well. I think, again, it's I'm an American sitting on American soil, right? I look at these things very differently than maybe somebody does internationally. But, you, again, we cannot discount. If you're the 16th largest buyer of U.S. Treasuries at the same time that China, Japan, et cetera, is all buying Treasuries less, these things are going to become a very, very important part. And then also Tether, I mean, if you look at their numbers, right, it's one of the most profitable businesses on a revenue to uh, employee basis in the world. And so instead of attacking these types of businesses, we should be looking at it and saying, how do we create more of these businesses? But next time, let's not let it happen outside the United States. Let's make sure that it's based here in the United States. Anthony, this was awesome. Got to leave it there. Come back soon. That is Anthony Pompliano of Pomp Investments. Now coming up, details on the SEC hack that prematurely claimed that the regulator had approved a spot Bitcoin ETF. That's next. This is Bloomberg Crypto. Details about the hack of the SEC's X account that led to a post claiming that the spot Bitcoin ETFs were approved, but that was one day before the actual announcements. Bloomberg's Lydia Bayoid reported on this from Washington. She joins us now. And Lydia, uh, this all comes back to a cell phone, it seems like. That's right. The SEC confirmed for the first time that it was, in fact, a SIM swap attack uh, targeting one of its staffers uh, that contributed to this fake post on X. What is the ultimate reputational damage that the SEC is going to face um, regardless of uh, kind of sorting out the problem now? I mean, we did see the SEC approve ETFs the next day, but uh, this was a pretty serious breach. It was. They're taking it really seriously. There's a whole alphabet soup of agencies that are helping them investigate exactly what happened. They've reiterated that it was, it seems to be an individual who uh, was the hacker uh, they keep saying, you know, they only had access to the social media account for a short period of time, that no, none other uh, internal or social media uh, or public-facing accounts seem to have been breached as part of this attack. Um, but that said, I think that the agency in Washington, the crypto industry, are all conscious that it doesn't look great for the regulator who's really emphasized the importance of cybersecurity. They just uh, passed new rules on cyber disclosures for publicly traded companies. So it's not a great look, uh, particularly in the context of cybersecurity concerns around crypto generally. Um, you know, we'll, we're going to see what happens next. Mm -hmm. They keep putting out kind of new, new reports, new details. So I think there's still a lot more to come here. Yeah, uh, I would say that this is the optics here. They're not great, uh, as you're well aware. Talk to us quickly about uh, what actually transpired here, because uh, the SEC, it did say that multi-factor authentication of its X account, it was disabled in July. It wasn't re-enabled until after the incident. So it's back on now, at least. You're right. That's also part of these new details the SEC has disclosed about the, the hack. And it actually said that they request, the SEC itself requested the multi-factor authentication to be disabled last July because they were having trouble accessing their X account. So they kind of left that uh, additional security off until I think just after uh, they kind of became aware of the incident and were working with X to re-enable that security. Bloomberg's Lydia Bayoud, we thank you so much for your time. And coming up next week, we're going to talk to Coinless CEO Andy Bromberg. He joins us. Stick with us. This is Bloomberg.